Hi, I'm Tim and this is part 8 of the course on building products with JavaScript. We're finally finished our basic version at least of the REST backend and uh, today we're switching to the development of our web application using React, Webpack and all that kind of stuff. So in today's video I want to talk about the uh, Webpack setup with uh, React and React Router. So if you've already watched my uh, live stream which I did on doing all of that then you once, you know, as, as it usually goes, you probably won't find uh, too much useful information in this video but if you haven't watched the uh, live stream and you want just like sort of condensed information then this is exactly the video you should be watching. So let's, uh, I already pushed all the code on GitHub so you can fork it and uh, have a look at the commits yourself, but let's go back into the project and uh, actually have a look at what I've done. So first part I wanna talk about is Webpack. Uh, if you don't know, Webpack is a packaging tool which is used for the front-end applications and uh, I think it's like the most popular tool right now and uh, the reason is because you know it's quite powerful and allows you to do a lot of uh, things in a very nice uh, way. So here I have the webpack config right in front of me as you can see it's uh, quite lengthy. I will not say that I wrote it from scratch for this course specifically. Uh, I actually copied it from one of my older projects but uh, this is purely because it is uh, not an easy thing to write so it's like it's it's not hard in terms of um, you know doing it actually but it's hard in terms of complexity where you have to remember all the loaders names and regex for tests and all that kind of things but nonetheless I'm gonna go through the um, this config and tell you what exactly I'm doing here so as you can see here we are specifying a dev tool here which is a cheap source maps uh, which will be injected upon building so that we can actually know uh, where our code points to in terms of our like original files because you know transpilation and babel and all those kind of tools mess the code up so you cannot really debug if you don't have uh, source maps we have the debug mode enabled for now so because this is purely set up for development right now so this is not a uh, config you would use in production but yeah uh, next we specify the context which is our source folder uh, in client as you can see here I also created this client subfolder uh, entry pass is our bootstrapper for our application I'm going to talk about that just in a moment then the output is basically wherever you will um, output this e either when you compile the final version or if you use the dev middleware which I will talk a bit um, later on uh, it will be served from that position with React for example. So basically I say that I want to uh, serve it from the dist folder yeah? and uh, the path for this folder will be actually resolved to this client slash dist uh, in this case. And the file name for the final application is app.min.js which is actually a lies in this case because I'm not minifying anything yet. All right, then we have the resolution rules, which uh, specify the root for the project. Once again, this is the dear name of the client. Uh, we specify the automatically resolved extensions, which means that you can uh, skip giving the extensions. So for example, if I have .js files, I can just say uh, file name without .js. Same goes for JSON. That's quite handy um, to use with, you know, if you have a wide variety of files and uh, you don't want to specify some extensions and stuff like this. Uh, and then you can specify the modules directories. I mean, in our case, there's just node modules and I explicitly specified it as just, you know, to show you that you can actually provide different ones. If you have like uh, Bower, for example, which you should not be, by the way, using because it's deprecated, but uh, hey, you know, it's here. So it's quite nicely, uh, for example, for using the corporate modules that can be located in one common uh, place in your machine. All right, and then we have the most interesting part. We have the loaders array here. Uh, so the idea of a pack as a tool is a very simple one. Uh, Webpack just takes your uh, input file, your entry file, resolves uh, whatever requires you have uh, in a Node.js manner, and then puts it all of that stuff into one large file. That's all the Webpack on its own does. All the power of the webpacks comes from the loaders that pre and post process the files. So, for example, I can say that uh, here are my style loader files or style loaders configs, sorry. And uh, what I say here is basically if the file ends uh, on .css, apply uh, first apply CSS loader with the modules to it, and uh, then apply this style module loader, um, which will inject 
the styles directly into the page upon mod. And I want to exclude node modules, any styles that come from node modules essentially. So this uh, CSS with the modules thing is uh, called CSS modules actually. Let's um, open it right here in the browser tab. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if actually it was proposed to W3C, but it's a really nifty format that basically allows you to write CSS in any way you like for your specific uh, component, like React component, for example. And those classes will then be automatically transformed into uh, local classes. So in, in the code, you will use it as import styles from uh, local style CSS. And then it just says styles.class name. So obviously class names have to be like camel case or whatever, you know, that is kind of readable through JavaScript. Um, but they will be automatically transpiled into um, like local unique class names that are do not collide on the global scope, which is really cool. But since we're doing that, we need another uh, style loader, which will say that everything that is from node modules should be just loaded with the CSS and style loader because we don't want those modules there. Otherwise, all the uh, third party style sheets will be loaded as um, local ones and obviously will not be accessible through global scope, which means no styling. So that's something we don't want. All right, next config is uh, JavaScript. So this is basically what you expect. It's very similar to what we did with um, backend code. So we use Babel here. It's a Babel loader. Once again, we exclude node modules because we assume that all the node modules are uh, ready for use and transpiled and, you know, actually ES5. Uh, if you don't do this to your modules, by the way, you should because this is how people expect them to use. And I try, uh, like, I, I know there are a few modules that actually do that and uh, publish the ES next code, which doesn't work without Babel transpilation, but this is very painful to use. So please don't do that. All right, so we do uh, just one Babel loader. And uh, in this case, we specified the query actually with a plain string. Uh, but here we specify the query as an object because we have a pretty con complex config. Um, so what I do here is I say, okay, we have cache directory, uh, set it to true, which will be, uh, I think it's defaults to the uh, system temp. So basically it will cache whatever um, compilation steps it can. So basically if the file doesn't change, the next compilation will just hit the cache and will be may, way faster. So then I provide the presets. Um, in this case, we're using ES2015, a React preset for obviously React, and then stage zero as we did before for some nice stage zero features. Uh, additionally, I give um, one of the Babel plugins, which is called Transform Runtime Plugin. What that thing does is it basically extracts all the Babel wrappers that Babel applies to most places and puts them into one uh, global file, which works very nicely for browser because there's no you know code duplication. So there's no uh, if you don't do this, basically we'll have the same Babel code in each and every file it transpiles, which we don't want because it will increase the bundle size quite significantly. This just puts it into one separate file, which works nicely. All right, and then we have environment dependent uh, config. So we have the one for development and one for production. Um, unless you specify the environment, Babel will always consider this to be development environment. So for development, we use this uh, React HMRE uh, preset, which basically enables hot reloading, which I will talk about again a bit later. And for production, we have this really cool preset called React Optimize preset, which applies a ton of uh, React optimizations that will make your bundle smaller and actually faster, which is really great. All right, and then in addition, we have a bunch of um, smaller loaders. So we have a JSON loader. I'm not sure yet as actually if we are gonna use that, but let's just keep it for now here. Maybe we'll have some JSON config. Uh, and then we have uh, font loaders. So the if it's a WAF, TTF, EOT files, we're gonna use the URL loader, which can basically load any file. Um, this limit thing here denotes the size of the file that can be embedded into JavaScript. So if it's smaller than 10 kilobytes, then we actually just uh, inline it as a blob and then inject it into page. And MIME type obviously you know, denotes which MIME type should be used well when loading this file. Uh, after fonts, we do the same for images. So we have SVG, PNG, and GIF loaders. So, which means you can actually require all of those files using JavaScript. You can just say require fonts, require image, and it will actually be injected into page, which is uh, one of the, you know, the strengths of uh, Webpack. It seems a bit weird at first, but actually when you um, use it correctly, it becomes a very powerful tool. 
All right, so this is a uh, web pack and uh, next step we basically need to use it. So at the moment this, once again, I want to stress this, this is a development setup. This is not how you use it in production and will come to production like in the later videos once we uh, finalize the code more or less. Uh, but this is not how you do production development or production deployment, yeah? Okay, so to use that pack, we're going to use the express server, which will be our development server. Once again, stressing this, this is not production we. So we're going to use express with uh, Webpack development middleware and Webpack hot middleware for our hot reload. So the way it works is quite straightforward. So we just we take our Webpack config, we inject some additional plugins here for again, hot reloading and React, uh, because React uh, hot reloading preset actually uh, handles the errors for us, so we don't need the C webpack errors in there. Uh, then we change the entry point here again for hot reload. So you can, if you will uh, read about the uh, webpack hot reloading, you will actually see all of that in their documentation. So it's quite straightforward. Uh, what we do then is we initialize the webpack compiler. And uh, in this case, so basically, if, we, if it would be when it will be production, we will have. Very similar workflow, but instead of passing the compiler to middlewares, we will just call compiler dots um, compiler or assemble. I don't remember the exact function there, but basically you can just say that, you know, statically compile all my files to that dist folder. Uh, in this case, we're passing it to the middleware uh, with some additional config. And we use this middleware with our React uh, app. Um, oh, sorry, Express app, of course. And uh, in addition to that, we basically serve our folder statically. So whatever um, assets we might have here, images, whatever will be accessible. And then for uh, all the requests that come to request up uh, to Express, why am I saying I'm messing Express.js too much today? So for all the requests that come to the Express.js, we're going to serve the index file every time because, you know, we have a <clears throat> sorry, single page application. So we want to serve index.js all the time. And obviously we're gonna start the server on uh, port 3000. So that's pretty straightforward. You already should know that. All right, so now let's talk about um, app structure and React Router. So I've, as I said, this is a React app. So the bootstrap uh, file that is the our entry file looks really straightforward. We just require React because React is required wherever you actually using the JSX tags. In this case, I mean, you can go without a tag here as well, but I think it's just nicer like this. Uh, we require React DOM, which actually renders React into the page. And then we have our app, uh, top level app component, which we just say, okay, to render into this uh, app element. Yeah. So if we look at the index HTML, it's very straightforward. We don't really have anything in here. We just have our um, app script and then this diff with ID app where we where exactly we inject or render our application, right? So very simple. The app itself uh, is actually a React Router thing. So um, during the stream, I decided to go for the React Router version four, which is uh, still in alpha, I believe so, but they will be releasing it quite soon. So, you know, while well, we might as well just go with it, the API seems to be way nicer than the previous one. And you can do a lot of uh, pretty fancy things with it. The problem during the stream was that the documentation for it is still a bit lackluster. So I had some problems setting it up, but uh, since my stream uh, issues, they actually changed the docs and fixed all the problems that I had with it, basically. So the new version has way better explanation of how it works. Um, the way it works is actually quite straightforward. So as you can see here, we just define the um, React component, which is the uh, functional component. So it doesn't have any state. We don't need any state in here. Uh, we use this browser router, which will use the HTML5 uh, routing when available or the hash uh, bang routing when not available. And um, this one is not obvious. So you always, the browser router only takes one element at the top. I had problems with that during the stream. I had to like, I tried to pass in the stuff without div. So basically just, you know, the um, roots, which kind of makes sense, but that doesn't work. You actually need to pass one top level element here. Uh, and then we pass the um, uh, two pages slash uh, like the home one, basically an other one. And then we have the miss uh, thing, which will match all other routes, uh, which will direct to our not found page. So after that, we have our three components, home, other, and not found, which are located over here. Um, they are once again, very straightforward. So uh, not found and other are stateless React components, which just return, uh, you know, 
h1 page not found or other ones just hello i'm other page nothing really fancy here home page is a bit trickier uh, it actually uses the react component syntax so this is the class syntax uh, and i had to create state here i mean if you look at it it's actually it doesn't really need any state uh, instead of you know like i mean okay i'm using word world from state but you don't actually need that here the problem is the React Hood routing, um, uh, React Hood reloading, sorry, actually requires stateful components or the components that extend React component to um, inject itself because it needs to know that this is a React component and detecting React components without uh, the constructor or without the React extension of the React component class is actually really hard. So the uh, stateless components are still a bit of a pain in ass to uh, statically analyze. Um, that's why I had to do that so that we can actually see how the um, hot reloading works because I think it's a very awesome uh, thing. So if I do react start now, uh, npm start and uh, go to localhost 3000, we will see our website here. As you can see here, we can navigate to other page and you know, if we enter some random bollocks and hit enter, we will actually see page not found. So it works as expected. The cool thing, so if I open the um, console now, we'll actually see that the hot reloading module is now connected. And if I go over here and I say, um, say other link and I hit save, we will actually see these changes immediately. So you can see that the um, server caught the changes the moment I saved the file, rebuilt the files and then injected them into browser. And this is what hot reloading is about, right? So I can actually, I can tweak the page and see the changes immediately. Like in this case, I have to switch screens, but you know, you can just um, say, uh, locate them on the same screen. Let me just move that here. So I can just do this, right? And uh, Basically, if I now cancel it, save it, and I can immediately see the changes here, which is pretty amazing. And uh, when you're working with um, UI and client-side apps, this is very helpful to correctly tweak your uh, user interface and user experience because you don't have to reload the whole thing and you know repeat the steps to get to the part or the component you're actually interested in, which is quite powerful. All right, so this is the hot reloading. Let me re um size that back again um what else do we have uh, i think that's basically it for now so i went through that stuff i showed you this so this is the core app structure that we're gonna basically develop from now on um in the next video like right now as you can see it's pretty lackluster all it does is just like render some pages and allows you to switch between them there's nothing fancy here um, what I'm going to talk about in the next video, and uh, again, I think I'm going to do another live stream for that. Um, so I'm going to set up the uh, Twitter bootstrap for styling because CSS frameworks are awesome. And honestly, you know, you have to, you need to use them anyway when you can, because they save you a lot of time and make things look a lot nicer just by applying some CSS classes. Um, and that's a huge time saver. Uh, then we're going to set up the Redux and uh, maybe some other stuff for state management. We'll see how it goes. So the thing is that I've used Redux just a couple of times just to get hang of it. Uh, the idea of it is quite straightforward, but I do dislike the tons of boilerplate it actually brings with it. Uh, but I have to be honest, I tried Redux only when it was like 1.0, I think, and um, if it ever was, but basically whenever it was officially released and I was like, yeah, this is like the first official release thing. Uh, and I had uh, some painful experience with setting up all the bootstrapping stuff. So we're going to see how that goes in a live stream. Uh, probably I'm going to talk a bit about RxJS, which is the very awesome library, which can actually replace uh, Redux completely. And I used that in uh, used it in this way in a couple of my projects quite successfully, I would say. Uh, it's um, it makes it a bit harder to debug at least with the RxJS 4 because the stack traces become quite long but I think Rx5 solves that problem although it's still not uh, released but we'll see how that goes basically um, yeah I think that's about it for today so if you have any questions as usual leave them down in the comments or come to our Gitter chat and ask there I am trying to hang out there as much as possible and answer whatever questions you might have guys um, so yeah thank you for watching and see you next time bye